All right. So shameless plug, I'm on the job market. This is how you can find me. Um, so we're going to talk about Drifter ML today, uh, which is a model, uh, as Lonnie said, for productionizing uh, and then testing your machine learning models once they've gone into production. So um, it's extensible, it's open source, and we follow the scikit-learn API. So as long as your model has a fit and predict, you can use this framework. So why? Um, basically, in the real world, uh, you know, you're not always going to have the same data that you trained your model on. So, you know, retraining is very expensive. Um, you know, like if you're dealing with a model like Jonathan was talking about, it can, it can be, take a long time to, to train uh, such a model. And so <clears throat> uh, being able to retrain at the right moment is super important. And so you want to know when your model has kind of drifted away from what your expectations were, your assumptions. It's also a great way to do sort of like prototyping. So if you have like a test set and then you have like a, a training set and then you send it to production and you know, maybe you label some of the production results uh, by hand or whoever, however you created that first labeling set, you can then validate your assumptions in the uh, production context. So um, yeah. There's some things that I'm trying to sort of model here, the performance, how fast it runs, how accurate the model is, whether it's fair and equitable and having a minimal uh, memory footprint. So um, I've been able to cover these three cases so far. I actually just added this fourth one today. Fair and equitable thing. I think I have a good beat on how to do that, but I haven't done that yet. Okay, so um, now that I've kind of given you the high level idea, let's talk about how I did this and kind of like uh, how I think about model drifts in a production context. So the first thing to really think about is what is a model? A model is a representation of your data, much like a descriptive statistic. And it was this key, this central insight that was really important when I was thinking about um, how to create this framework and thus how to test your model once it goes into production. So let's consider maximum likelihood estimation first and foremost. For those of you not familiar, Basically, what you can do is you can take some data and then you can actually use MLE. So this is maximum likelihood estimation here and then fit that data to figure out what the center and spread should be. Um, so these are the parameters of the distribution. So this is the one dimensional case. So this is the original data. And then this is the simulated data here. Uh, I don't know why it came out purple instead of blue, but whatever. Um, so in any event, um, you can see that these distributions are pretty close because the uh, model in this case, this maximum likelihood estimation with the normal distribution was like a good representation of your actual like population data. So this is uh, maximum likelihood estimation in the two dimensional case, also lovingly referred to as linear regression by some folks. So basically we can think of this model is kind of like recovering the um, the, the parameters of your distribution in a higher dimensional case. And that's really, I mean, it's not completely what's going on with the model, but you can think of it as a description of your data. Um, okay, so now let's go ahead and look at like sort of a worked example. So I put together this little Jupyter notebook to kind of show you the two circumstances. So really what we're doing at the end of the day when we model, when we, we're trying to figure out model drift is we're asking, is the data different? Um, from my training data to my production data. If it's the same, my model's doing great. It's gonna you know, hopefully do a good job fitting. So let's look at the case where it's different first. So this is like our training data or testing data. This is like our production environment. Then we split it up into a bunch of stuff. We run some model, in this case, logistic regression. And we can see this is the training data. And then this is the model uh, once it's gone to production. Now there's some really important subsets of, of concerns here. The first one is what happens when you don't have true labels? Well, uh, the way that we sort of do this is we start by training a model and then training a surrogate model, uh, which just basically means you take the parameters of your original model and then use those to retrain on the production data. So this is only using the data that we saw as input and the predictions from the model that we that uh, the model, sorry, the predictions from the model once it's, it's gone uh, into, into reality. So we call this original CF fit to get our Y. So it's X and then Y prediction that we're training our surrogate model on. Now you can see here, uh, we're able to recover 
uh, the descriptive statistics about our, our classifier. And it turns out that um, they're way off. Um, so this is like the foundational insight. By Now we never needed um, this second uh, y, uh, this, this, sorry, uh, this second y2. We never really need it except, uh, yeah, like at all. And so you never need true production labels in order to figure out if your model has changed from your testing and training environment to your production environment. And that's the key insight behind Drifter ML and all the work that came after it. So just to validate that this, like, I'm not just pulling your leg and this is actually true. If we have similar data, right? So both are similar. Then we can look at the precision and recall for the model and we can look at the precision and recall for the surrogate. And they're not exactly the same because these are random simulated data points, but they're pretty close, right? Like, so like precision for class one is 45. Here it's 43, 68, and 70. And so, you know, we have like a pretty good sense that um, this is sort of gonna hold in, hold in general. And the reason for this really is because a model is just a representation of your data. It's just like a descriptive statistic. Um, and so, you know, if your descriptive statistic changes, then you can be sure that your data has changed. And that's really what's sort of at work here. Okay, so that's like all the intuition behind it. Let me go back to the presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna outline those steps one more time just because I'm sure I lost some people in that. Step one, you do your exploratory analysis, like always. Step two, you split into train, test, and validation. Step three, you use your training data to train your model. Step four, you validate your model with your test data, right? So you basically check your test data again. You store your validation data, which is your like third partition. So just to make that super clear, here we had uh, X test, X val, X train, X test. So those are the three sets and then we just split it into 50% and then 25 and 25, which is like not always possible, but like if you can do it, that's super great. Okay, so then you put your model to production, you capture all the data that goes in your model once it's in production, as well as the predicted values, that's super important. Then you train your surrogate model with the same hyperparameters, that's also super important as your model currently in production on the captured data in step seven. So the way you do that is just by, come here, is just by, uh, let me scroll up to it. Yeah, it's just by doing star, the classifier, and then get param. So uh, scikit-learn is super great. It makes training a surrogate model really, really, really simple. It's easy to do. Okay, going back into this and then uh, step nine, you test your you test your model. So that's what we're going to cover next. All right. So why would you do this? Uh, I gave like a couple examples, but basically, making sure your assumptions are really accurate. Um, you can test this with this model. Um, you know, you can uh, make sure that your production environment is essentially similar. That's really kind of like the central ethos here. But you can also make sure that you're retraining appropriately because if things do change, then you can retrain on more labeled data. All right. So let's see how DriftRML works. Let's look at the API. So this is the documentation. I tried really hard to make this clear. I hope it is. If you have any questions about this, please let me know. So this is another example. We're training a model again, right? Then we're doing our, uh, you, can, you can test against your model uh, before you put it into production like you would normally. All right, so once you productionize things, right? We just sort of like reading our data, We've got our model, we've got our train test splits, whatever, whatever, we can do our classification report. Okay, so now we're gonna do some tests. So here we're gonna sort of read things in, right? We've got our prod CLF, we get our, our, uh, our surrogate model here, this is our, our test CLF. And then uh, this classification uh, test is where we're getting um, our, our test from, so we, kind of uh, pass in our test CLF, um, our test data, our target name and our columns. And then we're able to run a test just like we normally would. So this is like, you know, just how you would do testing normally. So it's not like anything fancy. It can fit in a PyTest pipeline. Um, you can use it kind of however you want. Uh, this is just a really naive kind of like you set a lower threshold for like your precision um, not being below a certain level. Um, but you know, you can make this thing as complicated as you want. Um, yeah, so I won't go through, I won't belabor that too much. 
Um, but yeah, so that's like an example of a test. Can I go back to my PowerPoint? Yes, I can. Um, okay, so that's like pretty much the whole thing. Oh wait, no, there should be, oh yeah. Sorry, almost forgot. One more example. So just to make it like super crystal clear, um, there's like an example you can run on your own. Uh, this is like the web URL. So here are a bunch of tests, or one test, sorry. So we looked at a classification example already. If you want to understand regression, you can also look at the mean squared error. For this case, you would look at the upper bound instead of the lower bound. And yeah, that's, that's kind of it. All right, I am done. So I'll take questions now. Uh, so we have a question from Money, if you want to look in the chat. Oh, okay, let's do it. If people have more questions, drop them in. Uh, okay, so uh, awesome tool, thanks very much. Um, how do you know or find out the target labels on the production data? So you don't ever need the labels on the production data. That's the whole point of this, is that all you need is the validation labels, and then you get the, um, the, the labels from production um, just by like getting the simulated ones from the production model, but you never actually need the true production labels. Uh, it's the stats, okay. Uh, it's the stats of the prod data. Yes, it's the stats of the prod data. Yeah, so yeah, basically. Uh, so you can use a neural network. So there's another question. How about using this for a neural network? Is there support already? Yeah, so um, there is already support for neural networks. All you have to do is use the Keras, uh, you know, uh, wrapper uh, for the scikit-learn Keras wrapper, and then you can use uh, a deep neural net um, just like you would for any of the, the scikit-learn models. So yes, this does work with neural networks out of the box. So you can use TensorFlow to, um, yeah, or you can use Scorch if you want to use PyTorch. Um, yeah, anything that conforms to the scikit-learn API of fit and predict uh, will work. And I think uh, I only use the Keras-like interface with scikit-learn, but I think there's a fit and predict on just the regular Keras interface. So this should actually work either way. Thank you. Please do play around with it. It's, it's open source. It's available. I'll just like show you real quick. Let me go back and share. So if you want to play around with it, um, there's two ways you can get to it. You can download the source if you're interested from right here. So this is one way. And then the other way is it is on PyPy. So you can just do a pip install and then you're good to go. So yeah, you can start running this in production tomorrow if you want to. Um, it's pretty easy to set up. Just pip install and then you know set up your tests like you would anything else and you're good. Inquire. Let's see if there are any other questions. Um, all right, is there any way to proceed when a privacy reasons it's impossible to capture data in production? Oh, that is a fascinating notion. Um, so you do need access to the production data, um, but that said, uh, you can use uh, things like PySift to get like, or um, there's like differential privacy uh, sort of like uh, simulated data. So you could capture like the, um, the anonymized or the simulated uh, data. Um, and then you could, yeah, exactly. You could use the, the anonymized or simulated data. Um, and that would allow you the opportunity uh, to still use this in a production setting. You might get a little bit of fuzziness just because like um, any, you know, encryption or encoding of your, your data is going to be a little bit fuzzy. Um, but, you know, this should by and large work. So you would look for larger deviations from your precision recall F1 score, whatever metric you're using, rather than um, just looking at sort of like tight bounds. So as long as you're a little bit more uh, amenable to things getting a little wider, then you should be okay. But yeah, you basically uh, can use this in a privacy context out of the box. Um, yeah, assuming you can get uh, production data that's uh, anonymized or, or, or in some way. All right, thank you, Eric. We're You're gonna welcome. give feedback to you 30 seconds if you can drop in a question. If not, um, I will post Eric's. Uh, I posted a link to Drifter ML in the chat already. 
uh, and then I'll link to Eric's Twitter uh, and all that jazz uh, in the show notes and in the Slack community. Eric, I think we have one more question. Yes. So can you use, how is this used with NLP? So um, natural language processing, as long as it's a prediction task, uh, it should be exactly the same setup. Um, because the, the data that you're, you're sort of like feeding in is, is natural language is no big deal. Um, so for time series, I don't think this works because you're not, you're not doing a prediction task. However, I am going to add uh, separate uh, model drift things for time series. You can also use um, scikit multiflow for time series. It's really well set up for time series data, um, but yeah. Yeah, so uh, if it's a classification or regression problem, uh, Drifter ML works perfectly. Um, you know, it will, it will capture everything. If it's a uh, time series forecasting uh, thing, then I don't, I don't think it works well, um, but maybe it does. You know, I've not tried it really on a time series problem. I think scikit multiflow is like definitely the way to go, but I could even try it like on a time series problem to see if, if it works, but yeah, cool. And then there's one more question about oh. it by Ryan. Oh, really? Related to NLP, what if the corpus changes for prod? Does that not change anything? Um, ooh, good question, Ryan. I have to think about it. I, I know Ryan, so I'll get back to him. But um, I, I suspect it, uh, I suspect if the corpus changes for prod, then that would adjust things like quite a bit and then you would just get model drift. But we can talk about this. This is a further discussion to be had. All right, well, uh, I guess I'll call that uh, right now. Um, but yeah, thank you all. Uh, this was super fun and yeah, and good luck to the rest of the speakers.